everyone. Welcome to the University of Toronto Scarborough, students, faculty, staff, members of the community. And I especially am excited to have the honor and privilege to welcome and introduce Professor Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky is an institute professor and professor emeritus of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Noam Chomsky has truly worldwide standing as an individual who has fundamentally contributed to the advancement and history of intellectual thought. He is author of more than 150 books and numerous, innumerable, numerous scientific articles. He has contributed to the creation of numerous scientific disciplines. He's considered the father of theoretical linguistics, a major figure in analytical philosophy. He is known around the world for his important political writings. To be sure, he is known for advancing intellectual thought about the time and the world that we live in. There is so much to say that last night with my daughters, uh, we put Professor Chomsky's name into the computer and there were 12 million hits. So with that, I thought, gee, um, what should I say? So in the end, I decided to make this a personal ode to my dear Professor Chomsky. I met Noam Chomsky three times and I know him for 37 years. And in a moment, I hope that becomes a seat that makes sense. The first time I met him, I was an undergraduate at Columbia University, and I was in charge of a little chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky, for obvious reasons. <laughs> and it was, and the, it was a serious scientific question in which our goal was to see whether all aspects of human language were entirely teachable and learnable through environmental input. This was still a time where many in psychology embraced, embraced B.F. Skinner's behaviorism, and many said, just simply train him. He'll learn language. So I tried, but what the chimp was doing was not quite what we humans do. And then I met and discovered the linguistic writings of Noam Chomsky. Chomsky showed how aspects of human language had to be under our unique species biological control. He showed that there was no way a human child could learn, as a child, every sentence that they could ever produce in their lifetime. He showed us the shared properties that were at the heart of syntax. In fact, Chomsky at the time was everywhere. The New York Times had announced him, had announced that linguistics was hot. The Chomskyan revolution was termed, he was the talk of the town, and his ideas were sending shockwaves through disciplines around the world. Psychology, anthropology, sociology, artificial intelligence, and many more. So, inspired by Noam Chomsky, I was set. I was going to go to graduate school to study the psychology of language. The second time I met Noam Chomsky was a graduate student at Harvard. It was my very first day of my very first class as a graduate student, and oh, how optimistic I was. B.F. Skinner was giving a lecture, and I sat in the first row. During his talk, B.F. Skinner announced that there was no mind, no thoughts, no internal mental representations, no poetry. Everything that we think is uniquely part of our mind was learned entirely through reinforcement with the environment. At that point, Professor Skinner said, were there any questions? Oh, I raised my hand. I was so earnest. And very politely, I attempted to explain to B.F. Skinner that evidence from psycholinguistics, neuropsychology, language acquisition, and in particular linguistics, demonstrated that his assertion was incorrect. <laughs> B.F. Skinner looked at me. He took his glasses off, he rubbed his face, he leaned on the podium and he said, young lady, we do not ask those questions here. If you want to ask those questions, you must go up Mass Ave to him. <laughs> and him meant him. Now I want to say that Skinner was being true to his beliefs. He believed what he was saying was true. This is not what concerned me. I respected his views. 
Instead, it was the first time that I realized that truth was not absolute. It was relative. And it could be packaged and altered, ignored and even repressed, even in the walls of a university. This is when I discovered Noam Chomsky's political writings. So I took uh, the advice, and I did go up Mass Ave, and I took courses with him, Professor Chomsky in linguistics. And there I met him as a person and as a professor. As a professor, he was kind, caring with his students, passionate that his students learn, that each person truly understood. He was committed to fairness, and he was very, very kind when our papers were not handed in on time. <laughs> he was a rem remarkable person. He would cancel meetings and stay home with his six sons so that his wife, Carol, didn't have to take off from work. To be sure, all of you students who have had me, I hope, if I haven't failed him, have also met Noam Chomsky in spirit. Thus, we are truly fortunate to have Professor Chomsky here tonight. We cognitive, psych, psych, cognitive neuroscientists just love statistics, so if you'll indulge me, I'll close with a few of them. According to the Arts and Humanities Citation Index, Noam Chomsky is the eighth most cited human being of all time up there with Aristotle and Descartes. He is considered the most cited living author on planet Earth at this day. He is considered the promin a prominent cultural figure and controversial in the most exciting way. So get ready for a little more thought-provoking and exciting controversy as I thank Professor Chomsky for the gift of his presence at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Thank you. Is this the fourth time? <laughs> <laughs> Got to be more than that. Uh, well, let me start with the uh, activism of the 1960s, the period when, that Laura was talking about. Uh, that uh, period aroused uh, quite deep concerns uh, right across the mainstream uh, spectrum of thought uh, on the right. Uh, there were these uh, concerns were expressed eloquently in an influential memorandum by corporate lawyer uh, Lewis Powell. He was soon to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, the concerns were uh, uh, expressed in an important study uh, of the Trilateral Commission, it consists of uh, liberal internationalists from the three major industrial areas, Europe, North America, and uh, Japan. Uh, their general outlook is uh, uh, illustrated by the fact that the Carter administration was drawn almost entirely from their ranks. Uh, both of these reactions merit attention. Uh, they provide good, aspect, good uh, insights into the uh, ideological aspects of the assault on democracy and rights that was just beginning to take shape uh, in, at that time, early about 40 years ago, uh, escalating very sharply in the uh, Reagan-Thatcher years, and now reaching new heights. And they also provide uh, considerable insight into how this assault uh, targets the educational system, uh, by now to an extent which uh, quite literally threatens their independent existence. Uh, Powell's mem memo, 1971, was sent privately to the chair of the uh, Education Committee of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the main business lobby. It reached the public when it was leaked by uh, journalist Jack Anderson. And the title was The Attack on the American Free Enterprise System. Uh, the, the memo urged, I'm mostly quoting now, merged a, urged aggressive measures to beat back the attack on free enterprise uh, that was led by such uh, dread figures as uh, Ralph Nader uh, with his campaign to protect consumer safety, 
uh, Herbert Marcuse, uh, who was uh, preaching Marxism to his vast enthralled audience, uh, young new leftists who were on the rampage, but primarily the naive victims of their propaganda who dominate the universities, uh, um, the schools, the uh, television, uh, the media generally, uh, the educated community, and most ominously the government, which they virtually control. Uh, this powerful assault, he said, was a dire threat to freedom because, I'm quoting him, the only alternatives to free enterprise are varying degrees of bureaucratic regulation of individual freedom, ranging from that under moderate socialism to the iron heel of the leftist or rightist dictatorships. Well, despite the slightly deranged tone, the memo is worth reading to understand the uh, uh, attitudes of the business world uh, faced with what was called the time of troubles. It's the standard time for that period, which had a very worrisome uh, civilizing effect on the societies. Uh, as an aside, uh, Powell was quite familiar with another alternative to free enterprise, uh, namely the system in which he and his Chamber of Commerce associates thrived. Uh, he was an influential lobbyist for the tobacco industry, and he was surely aware that uh, of the huge federal subsidies uh, for the production of this uh, leading killer, uh, which not only kills users on a scale uh, vastly beyond the targets of the mostly farcical drug wars, uh, but also huge numbers of passive smokers. Uh, it's collateral damage in the contemporary idiom. And Powell was surely aware of the great successes of lobbyists like him in assuring that uh, for many decades the government would help the industry conceal uh, what it knew about the lethal product that they were peddling with many corpses to show for their achievement still piling up rapidly. But that didn't keep him from wailing in the memo that, as every business executive knows, few elements of American society today have as little influence in government as the American businessman, the corporation, or even the millions of corporate stockholders. Uh, it's hard to know that, it's hard to imagine that Powell did not also know of the crucial role of the dynamic state sector in creating and sustaining the entire high-tech economy, particularly after World War II. Although as a product of the educational system that he thinks had collapsed into fevered anti-Americanism, he may have been unaware that large-scale state intervention had a major role in turning the United States into the leading economy of the first world. It's an important matter that I'll have to put aside now. Uh, Powell's comments are partially accurate, however. He's right that bureaucratic regulation constrains the freedom of the powerful, including the corporate sector that he served. In fact, it was the success of Powell and his fellow lobbyists in blocking such regulation that opened the way to corporate slaughter on a truly massive scale by the tobacco industry and many others. Lead, asbestos, uh, toxic chemicals, unsafe cars, and on and on. And it's that same success in defeating bureaucratic regulation that protects them from the consequences of their crimes. It's also true, true that the uh, New Deal bureaucratic regulation prevented any financial crises at all prior to his 1971 memorandum, and that with the dismantling of that regulation, as corporate control of the government grew from enormous to overwhelming, uh, crises began mounting in intensity until the present, uh, with the stage now set for the next one, which will be far worse. Uh, Powell also warned that uh, what he called the Marxist doctrine that was gaining such awesome power holds that the capitalist countries, capitalist is in scare quotes, the capitalist countries are controlled by big business, 
This doctrine, consistently a part of leftist propaganda all over the world, has a wide public following among Americans, he wrote, which is truly frightening. Uh, he could have added uh, that the Marxist doctrine that was gaining such awesome power uh, had been promulgated by influential figures uh, even before Marx. Uh, for example, in 18th century Britain, where a respected figure wrote that the principal architects of policy, government policy, are the owners of the society, at that time the merchants and manufacturers, who make sure that their own interests are most peculiarly attended to, however grievous the effect on others, including the people of England, but particularly the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans abroad. Uh, this uh, insidious, form, this eloquent formulation of the insidious Marxist doctrine that's threatening the very existence of our cherished free enterprise system uh, was in a, can be read in a book that's uh, greatly praised, but unfortunately little read, uh, Wealth of Nations by that incorrigible radical Adam Smith. Uh, the uh, miscreants of the Nader Marcuse led crusade uh, presumably also deplore what Adam Smith called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, uh, all for ourselves and nothing for other people. Uh, surely their predecessors did uh, without the benefit of uh, Marx or Smith or uh, other wayward European intellectuals, the 19th century American workers bitterly condemned the rising industrial system that was destroying their freedom and independence and was trying to impose on them what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self. That's mid 19th century. That's the doctrine that's uh, greatly admired by the masters of mankind today, and it's hammered into consciousness by every available means in the doctrinal systems that they manage. Powell went on to lament that the most disquieting voices joining the chorus of criticism of American business come from perfectly respectable elements of society, from the college campus, the pulpit, the media, the intellectual and literary journals, the arts and the sciences, and from politicians. Uh, although these new leftists are succeeding in radicalizing thousands of the young, he said, the greater cause for concern is the hostility to business of respectable liberals and social reformers. It's, their <clears throat> some, it's the sum total of their views and influence <coughs> which could indeed uh, fatally weaken or destroy our free system. And he then drew the obvious conclusion. The campuses from which much of the criticism emanates <coughs> sorry, are supported by tax funds generated largely from American business and by contributions from capital funds controlled or generated by American business. The boards of trustees of our universities overwhelmingly are composed of men and women who are leaders in the business system. Most of the media, including the national TV systems, uh, are owned and theoretically controlled <coughs> by corporations which depend upon profits and the enterprise system in order to survive. So they should therefore organize to defend themselves and just instead of just watching passively while business is destroyed by the Marxist onslaught and with it our fundamental freedoms. Uh, business power over universities must not, however, uh, tamper with the sacred doctrine of academic freedom, he insisted. Rather, it must labor to defend academic freedom by restoring the balance. That is, making sure that at least some small voice in the schools and universities remains uh, to plead that our societies are not wholly evil and that history is not solely one of destruction and uh, oppression, uh, contrary to what the innocent children are 
being taught in the schools and the TV propaganda. Uh, Powell was actually expressing very widely held attitudes and beliefs uh, which should not be dismissed on the, simply on the basis of their uh, patent absur absurdity and ignorance. In particular, his lament about the powerlessness of the battered remnants of corporate America is quite familiar. It's a constant refrain of those who have overwhelming power, but not total power, which is an intolerable affront for the masters of mankind. And more important, uh, Powell's advice was followed in many ways. His uh, entry in the standard encyclopedias of biography state correctly that in an extraordinary prefiguring of the social goals of business that would be felt over the next three decades, actually it's now four, uh, Powell set his main goal uh, as changing how individuals and societies, a society think about the corporation, the government, the law, the culture, and the individual. Shaping public opinion on these topics became and would remain a major goal of business. Now, there's one qualification needed. Namely, these have always been the social goals of the uh, masters of mankind, uh, notably in the United States, which to an unusual extent is a business-run society. Uh, U.S. labor history has been extremely violent, uh, well beyond the norm. Uh, modern America has been created over the workers' protest in the words of the most prominent historian of American labor, David Montgomery, his classic work, <coughs> The Fall of the House of Labor. Actually, the fall that he was referring to was in the 1920s, when labor had been virtually crushed, uh, along with independent thought. And as he put it, the corporate mastery of American life seemed secure in a most undemocratic America. That was actually an achievement largely of uh, Woodrow Wilson and his Red Scare as the worst period of repression in American history. And it should remind us that the assault on rights, uh, freedom, and democracy is not restricted to the right and the business classes. Uh, the 1920s were another gilded age, a period of uh, euphoria uh, for privilege and wealth, uh, the end of history and a utopia of the masters, uh, prospects of dazzling economic success. Actually, even my father, from a poor immigrant family, was caught up in the enthusiastic propaganda and bought a plot of land in Florida, which turned out to be somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that's uh, not unlike the chicanery of uh, subprime mortgages in the new gilded age that just uh, crashed around us. The 20s ended in the same way, of course. It ended with the Great Depression. And after a few years, there was a radical revival of labor and democracy. And that's a correlation that's constant and understandable. And the business world was terrified. Its press warned of, I'm quoting, the hazard facing industrialists with the rising political power of the masses and the renewed need to shape public opinion if we are to avoid disaster. Uh, new scientific methods of strike breaking were devised along with efforts to gain complete control over public opinion. Actually, these measures were put on hold during the war, but they were revived vigorously as soon as the war ended with a very wide-ranging campaign to beat back the threat of unions and independent thought and democracy very generally, in the words of business leaders, to wage and win the everlasting battle for the minds of men and indoctrinate citizens with the capitalist story until they're able to play back the story with remarkable fidelity and so on with an impressive flow which was accompanied by even more impressive and largely successful efforts that should be one of the central themes of modern history. Well, 1960s activism did indeed threaten the achievement. It chipped away slightly at the foundations, and once again it aroused the traditional fear, fears 
uh, well expressed in Powell's memo, and as his biographer comments, prefiguring the goals of business that have been executed with uh, a dramatic effect since the 1970s that includes the educational systems. Well, Powell's uh, memo expresses the concerns that were elicited by uh, the democratizing tendencies of the 60s uh, at the right end of the mainstream spectrum. Uh, perhaps even more revealing is the reaction at the opposite extreme, uh, the liberal internationalists. Uh, these are spelled out in the first publication of the Trilateral Commission called The Crisis of Democracy, well worth reading, uh, 1974. The crisis of the 60s is that there was too much democracy. Normally passive and apathetic parts of the population began to press their demands. The minorities, the young, uh, the old, uh, women, working people, uh, more generally the population, uh, commonly called the special interests. Uh, one sector of the population is not mentioned, the corporate sector. And that's correct. They represent the national interest, uh, much as Adam Smith explained, and therefore their power must not be challenged. Uh, a primary concern of the trilateral scholars was what they called the failure of the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Schools, uh, universities, uh, churches, and the like. Uh, 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 the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, rapporteur, Samuel, Professor Samuel Huntington of Harvard, uh, he explained elsewhere that uh, the architects of power in the United States must create a force that can be felt but not seen. Power remains strong when it remains in the dark. Uh, exposed to the sunlight, it begins to evaporate. We've got to watch out for those people who expose it to the sunlight. And indoctrination of the young must uh, assure that it remains in the dark. Uh, in general, the study urged, we must uh, have more moderation in democracy, their phrase, if it's to be preserved and if the national interest is to be protected. Well, the Powell Memorandum and the Trilateral Study, they spell out the concerns at the opposite ends of the dominant ideological spectrum. And these uh, closely shared concerns did lead to vigorous action to restore order, much as they had done in the past. Uh, one of the consequences of uh, these and other developments has been a sharp attack on public education, uh, taking many forms. I'll mention a few. A couple of months ago, I, uh, I went to Mexico to give talks at uh, the National University in Mexico, uh, UNAM, it's a, a very, quite an impressive university, uh, hundreds of thousands of students, uh, high quality and engaged students, excellent faculty. Uh, it's free. Uh, in the city, Mexico City, actually the, the government 10 years ago did try to add a little tuition, but there was a national student strike and the government backed off. And in fact, there's still an, a built, an administrative building on campus is still occupied by students and used as a uh, center for uh, activism throughout the city. Uh, there's also, a, in the city itself, there's a, uh, uh, another university which is not only free but has open admissions. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has compensatory options for those who need them. It was there too. It's also quite an impressive level students, faculty, and so on. Uh, well, that's uh, Mexico, poor country. Uh, right after that, I happened to go to California, uh, maybe the richest place in the world. And I was giving talks at the universities there. Uh, in California, the main universities, uh, Berkeley and uh, UCLA, uh, they're essentially Ivy League private universities. Colossal tuition, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, huge endowment, uh, the, the usual, the general assumption is they're pretty soon going to be privatized and the rest of the system will be, uh, which is quite, was extremely good system, best 
public system in the world, uh, that's probably going to be reduced to a kind of technical training or something like that. Uh, the uh, uh, privatization, of course, uh, means privatization for the rich. Uh, lower level of mostly technical training for, for the rest. And that's happening across the country. Uh, next year, for the first time ever, uh, the California system, which was a really great system, the best anywhere, it's getting uh, more funding from tuition than it is from the state of California. And that's happening across the country. Now, right now, in most states, uh, tuition covers more than half of the college budget. Uh, it's also most of the public research universities. Uh, pretty soon, only the community colleges, you know, the lowest level of the system, will be state financed in a serious sense, and even they are under attack. And analysts uh, generally agree, I'm quoting, that the era of affordable four-year public universities, uh, heavily subsidized by the state, may be over. Uh, that's one important way to implement the policy of indoctrination of the young. Uh, people who are in a debt trap have very few options. Uh, that's true of social control generally, it's also a, uh, a regular feature of uh, international policy, as those of you who study the IMF and the World Bank and others are well aware. Well, as the Mexico-California example illustrates, the reasons for the conscious destruction of the greatest public education system in the world are not economic. Uh, economist uh, Doug Henwood points out that it would be quite easy to make higher education completely free. In the US, it accounts for less than 2% of gross domestic product. The personal share, about 1% of gross domestic product, uh, is uh, a third of the income of the richest 10,000 households. It's uh, the same as three months of Pentagon spending. It's less than four months of wasted administrative costs of the privatized healthcare system, which is an international scandal. It's about twice the per capita costs of comparable countries, has some of the worst outcomes. And uh, in fact, it's, it's the basis for the famous deficit. If the US had the same kind of healthcare system as other industrial countries, uh, not only would there be no deficit, but there would be a surplus. Uh, however, to introduce these facts uh, into an electoral campaign would be uh, suicidally insane, Henwood points out. And he's correct in a democracy where elections are essentially bought by concentrations of private capital. Uh, it doesn't matter what the public wants. The public's actually been in favor of that for a long time, but they're irrelevant in a properly run democracy. Uh, we uh, should recall that the great growth period in the economy, the U.S. economy, was in the several decades after World War II, commonly called the Golden Age by economists. It was substantially fueled by affordable public education uh, and by university research. The public, affordable public education includes the GI Bill, which provided free education for veterans. And remember, that was a much poorer country than today. Uh, extremely low tuition uh, was found even at uh, private colleges. Actually, I went to an Ivy League college. It cost $100 a year at that time. You know, more, that's more now, but not high. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's not 30, 30 or 40,000, you know. Uh, what about university-based research? Well, as I mentioned, that's the core of the modern high-tech economy. Uh, that includes uh, computers, the internet, uh, in fact, the whole IT revolution, and a lot more. Uh, the dismantling of this system since the 1970s is among the many moves towards a very sharply two-tiered society. Uh, very narrow concentration of wealth and stagnation for most everyone else. Uh, it also has direct economic consequences. So uh, it takes, say, California. Uh, what they're doing to the uh, uh, public education system is going to undermine the economy. 
that relies on a skilled workforce and creative innovation, you know, Silicon Valley and so on. Uh, well, apart from the enormous uh, human cost of uh, depriving most people of decent educational opportunities, uh, these policies undermine a U.S. competitive capacity. That's very harmful to the uh, mass of the population, but it doesn't matter to the tiny percent of concentrated wealth and power. In fact, in the years since the Powell Memorandum, we've entered into a new stage of state capitalism in which the future just doesn't amount to much. The profit comes increasingly from financial manipulations. The corporate policies are geared to short-term profit. And that reduces the concern for, say, loyalty to a firm uh, over a longer stretch. I'll now talk a little more about this tomorrow, but right now let me just talk about the consequences for education, which are quite significant. Well, uh, suppose that, uh, as is increasingly happening, not just in the United States, incidentally, uh, suppose that uh, corporations are not uh, funded by the state, meaning the general community. So how are the universities going to survive? Uh, universities are parasitic institutions. Uh, they don't produce commodities for profit, thankfully. They may one of these days. Uh, the funding issue raises uh, many troubling questions uh, which would not arise if fostering independent thought and inquiry were regarded as a public good having intrinsic value. Uh, that's the traditional ideal of the universities, although there are major efforts to change that. So take Britain. According to the British press, the Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, was just ordered to spend a significant amount of its funding on the Prime Minister's vision for the country, his uh, so-called big society, which means big corporate profits and the rest look out for themselves. Uh, the government produced what they called a clarification of the famous Haldane principle. That's a century-old principle that barred such government intrusion into academic research. If this stands, which I think is kind of hard to believe, but if it stands, the hand of Big Brother will rest quite heavily on uh, inquiry and uh, innovation in the arts and humanities as the masters of mankind follow the advice of the Powell Memorandum, of course defending academic freedom in ways that would receive uh, nods of approval uh, from uh, those we must not name, I'll borrow my grandchildren's rhetoric. Uh, while Cameron's uh, Britain is seeking to take the lead in the assault on public education, uh, the rest of the Western world is not very far behind. In some ways, the U.S. is ahead. Well, more generally, in a corporate-run culture, the traditional ideal of a free and uh, independent thought may be given lip service, but other values tend to rank higher. And defending authentic uh, institutional freedom is no small task. Uh, however, it's not hopeless by any means. I'll talk about the case I know best at my own university which is a very striking case because of the nature of its funding. Technically, it's a private university, but it has vast state funding uh, overwhelming, and particularly since the Second World War. Uh, when I uh, joined the faculty over 55 years ago, uh, there were military labs uh, since they've been technically severed. Uh, and the academic programs, too, back at that time, mid-50s, were almost entirely funded by the Pentagon. Uh, under student pressure in the time of troubles, the 60s, uh, the, uh, uh, there were protests about this and calls for investigation, and a uh, faculty student commission was formed in 1969 uh, to investigate the matter. Uh, I was a member, thanks to student pressure. Uh, the, the commission was interesting. It found that despite the funding, funding source, the Pentagon, almost the entire academic program, uh, there was no military-related work on campus, except in the sense that virtually anything can have some military application. Actually, there was an exception to this, the political science department, 
Now, that was deeply engaged in the Vietnam War uh, under the guise, uh, naturally, of a peace research institute. Well, since that time, Pentagon funding has been declining, and funding from health-related state institutions, National Institute of Health and so on, uh, that's been increasing. There's a reason for that. It's a reflection of changes uh, in the economy. In the 1950s and the 1960s, the cutting edge of the economy was electronics-based. And the Pentagon was a rather natural way to uh, steal money from taxpayers, uh, making them think they're being protected from you know, the Russians or somebody, and to direct it to eventual corporate profits. And that was done uh, very effectively. Uh, that, as I said, includes uh, computers, uh, the internet, the IT revolution. In fact, most of the modern economy comes from that. Uh, in more recent years, the advanced economy is becoming more biology-based. Uh, so therefore, state funding is shifting. Uh, 50 years ago, if you looked around MIT, uh, you found small electronics uh, startups uh, from the faculty. They were drawing on Pentagon funding research. And if they were successful, they were bought up by major corporations. And those of you who know something about the high-tech economy will know that that's the famous Route 128, you know, Raytheon, ITT, and so on. And that was 50 years ago. And now if you go around the campus, the small startups are biology-based, and the same process continues, the genetic engineering, the biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and the big buildings going up, or Novartis, you know, and so on. Uh, that's the way the uh, so-called free enterprise economy works. Uh, there's also been a shift to more corporate funding. Now that has several effects. Uh, first, there's an emphasis, there's more of an emphasis on short-term applied work. Uh, the Pentagon and the National Institute of Health, uh, they're concerned with the uh, long-term future of the advanced economy. In contrast, a business firm uh, typically wants something it can use it, not its competitors, uh, and tomorrow. Uh, I don't actually know of a careful study, but it seems pretty clear that the shift towards corporate funding is leading towards more short-term applied research and uh, less exploration of what might turn out to be interesting and important down the road. Uh, another consequence of corporate funding is more secrecy. Uh, so surprises a lot of people, but during the period of Pentagon funding, there was no secrecy. And there was also no security on campus. You, you may remember this. You could walk into the Pentagon-funded labs uh, 24 hours a day, you know, no cards to stick into things and so on. And no secrecy. It was all entirely open. Uh, well, uh, there is secrecy today. A corporation can't compel secrecy but they can make it very clear that you're not going to get your contract renewed if what you're doing leaks to others. And that's happened. In fact, it's led to some scandals, some of them severe enough to have appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Well, uh, outside funding has other effects on the university, unless it's free and unconstrained, observing the whole day in principle, as indeed has been true to a significant degree with funding by the Pentagon and the other national institutions. However, any kind of outside funding, even keeping to the holding principle, uh, it establishes, say, I suppose it uh, establishes a research or teaching facility. Well, that kind of automatically shifts the balance of academic activities. And that can threaten the independence and integrity of the institution. Uh, in the case of corporate funding, quite severely, in ways that the Powell memo recommended and to an extent have been implemented. Uh, corporatization can also have uh, considerable influence in other ways. So corporate managers uh, have a duty. Uh, they have to focus on uh, profit making and seeking to convert uh, as much of life as possible into commodities. It's not because they're bad people, that's their task. And under Anglo-American law, it's their legal obligation. Uh, well, there's a lot to say about this topic, but one element of it, which bears on the universities and much else, 
Uh, one particular consequence is the focus on what's called efficiency. It's an interesting concept. It's not strictly an economic concept. It has crucial ideological dimensions. So if a business reduces personnel, it may become more efficient by standard measures with uh, lower costs. But typically that just shifts a burden to the public. Uh, a very familiar phenomenon. All of us see it all the time. Uh, well, costs to the public are not counted. Uh, they're colossal, but they're not counted. Now that's a choice that's not based on economic theory, that's just an ideological decision. And that applies directly to the business models as they're called for universities. So increasing class size or using cheap temp temporary labor, say graduate students, uh, instead of full-time faculty and other such measures, uh, that may look good on university budgets, but there are significant costs and they're transferred uh, and not measured. They're transferred to students and to the society generally as the quality of education, quality of instruction is lower. And there's furthermore no way to measure the human and social costs of converting schools and universities into facilities that produce commodities for the job market, abandoning the traditional ideal of the universities, encouraging creative and independent thought and inquiry, challenging received beliefs, exploring new horizons, free of external constraints. That's an ideal that's no doubt been flawed in practice, but uh, the extent to which it's realized is a good measure of the level of civilization achieved. Well, that ideal is being challenged very openly by uh, Adam Smith's uh, uh, principal architects of policy in the state corporate complex. The direct attack on the whole name principle in Britain uh, that's an extreme case, in fact so extreme that I assume it may be beaten back. Uh, but there are less, uh, less blatant examples. As many of them are just inherent in the reliance on outside funding, state or private. As it's said there are two sources that are not easy to distinguish given the control of the state by private interests. So what's the right reaction to outside funding? that threatens the ideal of a free university. Well, there, one choice is just to reject it in principle, in which case the university will go down the tubes. It's not a, it's a parasitic institution. Uh, another choice is to recognize it as just a fact of life that when, say, I'm at work, I have to walk past the uh, Lockheed Martin lecture hall and I have to look out my office window at the coach building, which is named after uh, the multi-billionaires who are the major funders of the Tea Party and a leading force in uh, uh, ongoing campaigns to wipe out the remnants of the labor movement and to institute a kind of corporate tyranny. Now, if that outside funding seeks to implement the Powell Principle by influencing teaching, research, other activities, and then there's a strong argument that it should simply be uh, resisted or direct, uh, rejected outright, no matter what the costs. But such, such influences are not inevitable, and it's worth bearing that in mind. So let me keep, again, the personal experience, uh, which is, again, pretty striking, because MIT is an important case of how outside funding works. Well, in my own Pentagon-funded university, I was teaching for many years uh, undergraduate courses on social political issues, pretty much the kind of things I write, uh, that explored uh, dominant systems of power and ideology, and there were often vicious practices from a highly critical standpoint. Now that was on my own time, of course, but it's not a serious difficulty. Facilities were there, and huge numbers of students and community people took them. Uh, you could open it to the community. Uh, more strikingly than that, uh, under Pentagon funding, almost full Pentagon funding, MIT in the 1960s became the leading academic center of resistance against the Vietnam War. Now, not protest, I'm talking about resistance. In fact, several of us who were fully funded by the Pentagon 
uh, avoided prison only by the sheerest accident. Uh, there were some attempts at disruption of my courses by the National Political Police, the FBI, uh, but they were mostly comical. Uh, beyond that, there actually were, uh, there wasn't any interference. Well, those uh, considerations apply quite broadly. Uh, right here, for example. Uh, so I understand there's a new school of global affairs to be established, funded by the Monk Charitable Corporation, uh, hence indirectly by Barrick Gold, world's largest gold mining uh, corporation. Uh, the international mining uh, industry generally is based largely in Canada, a huge scandal for Canada, I should say. It's causing great damage uh, to the environment and to peasant and indigenous communities worldwide. I've seen some of it myself. That uh, gold mining is the worst of all of them, uh, and Barrick Gold in particular has been pretty credibly charged with uh, quite serious uh, uh, the human rights violations as well. So acceptance of funding just clearly raises serious questions about potential uh, harm to academic programs and research, uh, questions, uh, uh, questions of uh, rather like the ones I mentioned at my own university, and maybe I should mention the obvious, that horrible as Barrick Gold may be, it doesn't begin to compare with the Pentagon. Uh, acceptance of funding uh, it clearly uh, it raises quite serious questions. Now, I don't know enough about the situation here to speak with any confidence, but members of the university uh, can, uh, and concerned citizens as well, can uh, pursue their proper concerns about these matters in quite concrete ways. So, for example, tomorrow uh, there's going to be a rally at 3 o'clock outside the Governing Council, uh, where, which is going to be discussing these issues. And proceeding further, a very natural topic for inquiry in a, uh, uh, in a school for public affairs in Canada, particularly a school funded by, the mining, by a mining corporation, obvious topic for inquiry in that school is uh, research and teaching on the impact of mining on the environment and on defenseless communities, uh, peasants, indigenous. Uh, people have little voice, remember, apart from what outside power and privilege can provide for them. So there are many opportunities to do things. I'm sure you can think of many more. Well, uh, so, so it's not a hopeless situation by any means. Well, I don't know of any simple answer uh, to the dilemmas that uh, constantly arise in trying to sustain the university independence and integrity within societies dominated by concentrations of power that have quite different values and goals, of course. But one thing does seem clear enough. Uh, such efforts cannot progress very far in isolation from much broader struggles to protect what has already uh, been achieved from severe ongoing attacks and to carry these achievements forward towards a world of much greater freedom and justice. Thanks. I think there's some mics somewhere, so I was told. Is there one on this side or this one there? Anybody see the mic? See oh, there's some one right there. Hi. Hi, okay. Um, if people want to ask something, maybe they can just line up the mic. Just have a question. Uh, I just would love to hear your thoughts on where the, uh, like the U.S. economy. Well, so you're going to have to translate for me. Go ahead. The U.S. economy just, uh, I've been reading and watching stuff and, uh, like one thing, you know, I don't know if this is verified, but the, you know, the Federal Reserve printing, you know, tripling the money supply since 2003. 
you know, you know, 14 trillion in debt, and then there may even be more in debt with in other kind of notes and things they use to try and hide, you know, the true number. But um, you know, and just you know, just the economy in general. Um, you know, tons of foreclosures, tons of debt. Um, you know, and uh, what your thoughts are on the U.S. economy and whether things are, you know, not, you know, maybe so good. Laura's my translator. I don't understand foreign languages like Canadian English. <laughs> What are your thoughts on the U.S. economy? What are your thoughts on the U.S. economy? On the U.S. economy? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I'm giving a talk about it largely about that tomorrow, so I'm going to go into details. But it's uh, there've been interesting developments. I will just very briefly, from uh, the uh, hundred years ago, the, the U.S. was the richest country in the world by a long shot, uh, huge margin. At, uh, after the Second World War, it really took off under massive government stimulus of the kind that I've talked about, uh, wartime and then post-war stimulus. And that was what people call the golden age, so a very rapid growth right into the 70s. Uh, and it was egalitarian growth. So the bottom quintile did about as well as the top quintile. Doesn't mean it's equal, but growth was parallel. There were also some moves towards the kind of you know, social democratic uh, sort of welfare state measures that are more common elsewhere. Uh, that was a benign period. Uh, it changed in the 1970s for very striking reasons. It was a big shift towards uh, financialization of the economy. So you go back to, say, the early 70s, uh, the proportion of corporate profits on the part of financial corporations was pretty small. And they were doing what financial corporations are supposed to do in a state capitalist economy. So, you know, in principle, a bank is supposed to uh, take uh, unused funds, like say your bank account, and uh, divert it to some productive purpose. That's their role. And they're more or less doing that. There were also no financial crises, because it was under this bureaucratic regulation that uh, Powell is so upset about. Uh, that changed in the 70s. Uh, currencies were freed up, no longer regulated, uh, uh, there were uh, no longer any constraints on capital movement, a huge increase in uh, financial speculation. Uh, also, just, you know, the rate of profit in uh, production was declining. You could make a lot more money by financial manipulations, so that's where capital went. Uh, well, this set off a kind of a vicious cycle in which uh, profits if it, this was associated with hollowing out of production. So, you know, you could send production to Mexico, China, Vietnam, make these profits in the United States, but uh, uh, the production there, very much like Canadian mining. So the profits come back, they, they don't stay in Colombia, they, they come back here. And they may count them in the gross domestic product of Colombia because they're produced there, but. They're in the gross national product of Canada, what matters. Uh, so, uh, so the hollowing out of production and the uh, financialization of the economy kind of went parallel. And that set in, uh, that started leading to a concentration of capital, mostly in financial institutions. Uh, for Adam Smith's reasons, that leads to concentration of political power, uh, decisions in the political realm to act in ways which increase the concentration of power and it set off a spiral, which is kind of unbelievable. Uh, everyone knows that the United States is unequal, highly unequal, but most people don't know that that inequality is mostly in the top, maybe one-tenth of one percent of the population. Uh, you take that away, it's unequal, but not kind of you know, off the scale. Uh, and, and that carries political power, and uh, you see it in the newspapers right now. Uh, when you read today, uh, today's papers, uh, the Republican Party programs, a Paul Ryan's budget, and that's a way of ensuring that more and more uh, wealth goes into the pockets of fewer and fewer people, and the rest of you can just, uh, you know, if you can survive, that's your business. Uh, and also there's this, going with this, is the lack of concern for the future of the economy. So like if you were a uh, 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 an executive for, say, General Motors, say, 50 years ago, that you wanted to make sure that the firm survived. 
uh, everything dependent on that. So you have to have brand loyalty and so on. If you're a financial manager, you don't care if the firm survives. You've got to make profits tomorrow. The firm goes down the tube, it's somebody else's problem. And uh, remember that the big production units are financial institutions. So General Electric, the biggest corporation, you know, supposedly productive corporation, more than half of its financial manipulations. Uh, there's, economists have kind of avoided this, but now they're starting to look at it interestingly. You take a look at the technical journals, you see some articles by, you know, Nobel laureates in economics and so on asking, you know, what are these financial institutions doing? You know, they're certainly not doing what they're supposed to do according to economic theory. And are they any benefit at all to the economy? Well, they're probably harmful to the economy in many ways, not just because of the repeated crises, but in lots of other ways, draining resources, all sorts of things. Anyway, that's what's been going on. So you've had for the last 30 years or so, essentially stagnation for the majority of the workforce. They've been getting by by increased working hours. U.S. working hours now are way above other industrial countries. And this is the richest country in the world, remember, uh, by uh, debt uh, uh, and by asset inflation, repeated bubbles like the housing bubble that just burst. Well, you know, that's plainly not sustainable. Uh, meanwhile, elections are getting more and more expensive to run in. The next election, 2012, is already estimated to be going to run at about $2 billion. That means if you want to participate in an election, you've got to climb very deep into the pockets of corporations. There's no other place where there's any money like that. Uh, for the Republicans, it's kind of reflexive. They stopped being a political party 20 years ago. And the Democrats are not very far behind. And, you know, uh, there's a couple of stragglers here and there, but essentially that's the tendency. Well, that is a vicious cycle. And people are very upset about it. You know, they're angry, frustrated, they hate everything. They hate all institutions. Uh, uh, but they don't know what to do about it. You know, they, there's very little organization. Uh, there's some, but it's in the wrong places. Uh, not entirely true, like what happened in Wisconsin. Is quite a, quite significant, I think. Now, that's a major uprising. Uh, they lost, but the losses are gains too. You set the basis for the next one, and maybe that'll take off. But I think that's roughly what's happening to the economy. I mean, people talk talk about American declinism, you know, relative to China and so on. In my view, that's mostly nonsense. China has enormous problems, uh, in the even worse that the United States and the other rich countries don't face. But there is a kind of declinism, namely the countries being destroyed from the inside by the masters of mankind. And for perfectly sound reasons, it doesn't matter to them. You know, they're doing fine. You know, uh, so like right in the middle of, uh, you know, the, when 20% of the population is qualifying for food stamps, uh, Goldman Sachs just quietly announced uh, $15 billion uh, extra compensation for uh, the managers who are responsible for the crisis. And uh, I was in England a couple of weeks ago, every, every day on the front pages, there's some new scandal about Barclay Banks and the huge uh, compensation packages. Yeah, you kick the country down the tube, and you make plenty of money, and that's the way it works. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about your thoughts about the, uh, the sort of shift in de demographics that's going to happen over the next 30 years with a huge part of the population. You can't hear me? Oh, speak cl closer. Even a, even a native Canadian can't hear me. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I can't hear I can hear, hear you, but it's a strong, very strongly echoed. Hello? <laughs> Give it a go. Okay. So I'm asking about uh, the change in demographics that's going to come about in the next 30 years or so, where a huge portion of the population will be um, over the age of 80. I know that's true in Canada. I don't know exactly how true that is in the States. And what you think, how you think that's going to affect the labor movement in the next, in the coming sort of 50 years? Changing demographics and which and the labor movement. In rich societies? Sure. Like the United States? Say. Yeah, and Canada. I'm kind of worried about that. 
Well, there's an effort to, to do something about that. Again, it's on the front pages of the newspapers. Now, that's why the, uh, the political parties are trying to cut back uh, uh, security for the elderly. You know, we don't care about them. What good are they? I mean, they're not making money for us. Uh, so, you know, the new spirit of the age of 1850 uh, says you ought to just get rid of them. Well, we're civilized. We don't put them on ice floes and send them out. <laughs> what we do is uh, cut back uh, health care, cut back Social Security, uh, you know, uh, just l let them uh, linger on the vine. I mean, that's essentially what's happening. You take a look at the budget proposals. That's essentially what's happening. This is all, a, there's a pretense that this has to do with the deficit. It's a complete pretense, it's just like in Canada. Uh, the, the deficit is coming from the cutback of taxes on the rich, which is continuing in the United States. So the same Paul Ryan's, you know, kill Social Security and Medicare, is saying let's cut back taxes on the rich. Okay, uh, and in fact, as I said, in the United States, it's not true in Canada, in the United States, the deficit has to do with the health care system. Of course, about half the deficit is uh, military spending, but that's untouchable. You've got to rule the world by force. Uh, but the other half the deficit is, uh, is, this, is the health care system. It's literally true that if the United States had, say, a European-style health care system, not a very utopian idea, there wouldn't be a deficit, there'd be a surplus. But you'll notice that that's not being talked about because the healthcare system is in the hand of the financial institutions, the insurance companies, and they are holy. Uh, and Obama knows it. So you take a look at his healthcare reform. Uh, most of the population wanted what they call a single payer plan, you know, Canadian style plan. And not because Canada is the greatest in the world, but at least people know that Canada exists. I mean, France you know, could be somewhere, you know, who knows where. Uh, so they want something like that. Okay, that's out the window. That's been true for decades. Uh, there was a public option proposed. If you take a look back at the health care debate, Obama gave it away without even an effort. That was over the objections of almost two thirds of the population. Uh, the pharmaceutical, the drugs in the United States cost way more than in other countries. I think they're probably twice as high as here. There's a reason for that. The United States is, I think, the only country, only one I know of, where the government, by law, is not allowed to negotiate drug prices with the pharmaceutical corporations. I mean, it can negotiate you know, prices for paper clips for the Pentagon, but not drug prices. Actually, there's one exception, the Veterans Administration, and their drug prices are kind of at the international level. Well, uh, what does the population think about this? 85% uh, are opposed. Obama just gave it away without a comment. You know, you want to be elected, those are the guys you're going to have to uh, butter up. Pharmaceutical corporations, insurance companies, and so on. Um, you know, it's kind of like the end of democracy, but uh, it's kind of understandable, you know. Uh, so what's going to happen to the elderly? Well, you know, it depends whether this assault continues. Actually, you might ask why there's so, such uh, hysteria about uh, trying to destroy Social Security. Uh, it's, it's a very popular program. It's, uh, and it's extremely inexpensive. It has almost no administrative costs. It's a public system, so it doesn't have high administrative costs like the privatized health care system. And it's very efficient. Uh, it's, it's, it's the basis for survival for a large part of the population. However, it has two defects. Uh, one thing, it's of absolutely no use for the wealthy. Like, I get Social Security, but, you know, I get a big pension, so it doesn't, don't notice. But for most of that, for, say, Pete Peterson, this multi-billionaire who's leading the campaign against it, uh, as he says constantly, it doesn't do me any good. That's true. You're a multi-billionaire. You don't need it. Uh, but for most of the population, it's survival. And that's particularly true after the uh, $8 trillion, maybe it's going to be $10 trillion collapse in the housing market. That was people's assets. They're gone. You know, they're destitute. They don't get Social Security, they starve. So that's one problem with it. It goes to the wrong people. 
But I think there's a deeper problem, which is never discussed. But in my view, it's fundamental. Uh, Social Security is based on a very dangerous idea. It's based on the idea that you care about other people. Uh, you care whether the disabled widow across town has food to eat. If you believe in the new spirit of the age, you know, her husband made rotten investments, that's her problem, you know, why do I care? Uh, the public attack on the public schools, I think, is based on the same principle. So, like, I don't have kids in school. So, according to the reigning principle, I should say I don't want to pay taxes. But why should I pay taxes so the kid over there can go to school? Well, you know, if you, if you, uh, you know, go down to the kind of, what to call it, the depths of savagery, where you just don't care about anything but yourself, that's the right attitude. And Social Security and public schools challenge that attitude. So they have to be dismantled. Uh, it's kind of hard to prove this. Nobody says it, you know, but I think it's pretty clear. Um, can I be heard like this? Is this better than the microphone? Or should I use the mic? Okay. I was wondering if you think that the solution may lie in public policies that seek to match funding from different sectors. So for example, if a university does take funding from a corporation, then public funding will have to match that funding. Or is it the case that corporate funding should not be part of the universities at all? Well, you know, in an ideal world, uh, maintaining a free, independent university uh, just ought to be a, a, a kind of a commitment of the public, like having public schools. Uh, people ought to have opportunities for education, advancement, pursuit of their own interests, uh, developing their capacities, uh, and contributing to the world. Uh, that's a, just a good that ought to be uh, uh, maintained. Well, you know, unfortunately, that you got to fight for that. It's very inconsistent with the new spirit of the age from 150 years ago. Uh, so, you, you know, you have to struggle about it. But uh, should you take corporate funding? Like, for example, should MIT have taken money from the Coach brothers? Well, I, I really can't say no, because if they don't, there won't be a cancer center. You know, there won't be research in biology. Uh, it's a fact of life. Can we do something about it? Yeah, we can. You don't have to submit to their, to the kinds of pressures that they might want to impose, whether it's the Pentagon or the corporations. There are a lot of ways around it. I mentioned a few, but you can think of plenty more. And the cases I mentioned, if you think about them, they're pretty extreme. I mean, at MIT, to repeat, it was almost 100% Pentagon funded in the 1960s, it was this academic center of anti-war resistance. You know, real resistance, you know, support for deserters, and all sorts of things. Uh, well, it went on, and it was incident, interesting that there was no effort to stop it. So there's a lot, there's, a, there's pretty free societies, you know, there's quite a range of things you can do. In the case of, say, the uh, uh, monk contribution, I think there are a lot of things that can be done, like what I mentioned. Uh, to re a school of uh, global affairs in Canada, uh, especially one funded by the mining in industry, could very well be offering a voice to the people who are being destroyed by this industry. And that's right within their mandate. You know? And could be, organi you know, could be educating and organizing to do something about it. You don't have to watch while this happens. I mean, there's solidarity groups that go down and help indigenous people who, uh, and who are being wiped out by mining communities. Actually, one of my daughters does it. I was down there this summer in southern Colombia, same thing. These things can be done and they can actually be organized in uh, university uh, departments. Nowhere better than I can think of than something like that. Are we over here? Okay. Uh, I'm also curious about higher education. Uh, you mentioned that it seems like quite a bit of work is done by postdocs and graduate students. Uh, it seems like this is a bubble. 
Uh, it, it, every, if every faculty member is graduating one protege every year, there's too many of us. And, uh, and I was wondering uh, if you could comment on, on maybe the size of, of uh, graduate education in the United States and Canada. Is it too big or, uh, or should we be producing this many PhDs and, and finding work for them? I think there's a lot of work for graduate students to do. The graduate students are producing the, uh, the culture, the uh, arts, the science of tomorrow, as well as just uh, you know, achieving their own goals, which, are, which is a value in itself. So sure, I think, it ought, I think it ought to be like a poor country like Mexico, where it should be free, uh, open admissions, and put whatever resources the country has into doing this. These are high values. I mean, look, Mexico is a poor country, like it's not Central Africa, but it's not the United States or Canada either. And as I mentioned, in the United States, the period of very significant free education was the 50s and 60s. It was a much poorer country, much poorer, you know, by any measure. These are not economic problems. A uh, question from Paulina, who's watching uh, the live stream. How can the U.S. citizens get the Supreme Court ruling overturned that allows for unlimited corporate funding to political campaigning? Unlimited funding to political campaigning? Yeah, how could we Actually, it can be stopped. Uh, and there's some states that, like Maine, for example, has cut it back. It can be done. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case last year, which you may have followed, called Citizens United, uh, where the, uh, there's a very right-wing Supreme Court now, they, I mean, effectively, I can give you the details if you want, it effectively said that corporations can buy elections directly instead of indirectly. You know, they have other, <laughs> and uh, that's, it hasn't ever had an effect in 2010, I'll have a bigger one beyond. That's probably why the next election is estimated at two billion dollars. Well, you know, if you look at their reasoning, uh, their reasoning sh should not be permitted in a free society. It goes way back. Um, the reasoning is based on two principles. Uh, first of all, that corporations are persons, right? That goes back a century. I mean, a corporation is a legal fiction created by the state. Why should it have the rights of persons? And by now they have rights way beyond persons. So that's one. And the other is that money is speech. So that's why the American Civil Liberties Union supported that uh, Supreme Court decision. Well, you know, if uh, legal fictions created by the state and sustained by them are persons, and persons have freedom of speech, and money is speech, well, you know, okay, it follows. Uh, should any of that be permitted? I mean, it's outlandish. I should say that when corporations were given personal rights about a century ago, uh, there was a lot of protest by conservatives. And that's a category of people that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, the name exists, but conservatives are gone, you know, the classical liberals, basically. I mean, they protested. This was a sharp uh, attack on classical liberalism, which holds that rights in here in persons of f flesh and blood, you know, not uh, collectivist legal fictions constructed by state power for the benefit of the rich. You know. Well, they, they were beaten down. Actually, it was the progressives who favored uh, these rules. I should say it's a complicated story. Uh, but I don't think that should be tolerated, nor the idea that money is speech. So, so that can be stopped. And then there, there are all kinds of ways of limits on campaign funding. I mean, most of the world does, does impose such limits. You know, short campaigns. Uh, a uh, month with no television ads. There's a lot of things you can do, technical things. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's about as difficult as trying to go after the healthcare system. There's so much power concentrated uh, in the economic and political system and the media to try to bar this that it takes a real massive, massive public organization to do something about it. That takes a lot of work. I mean, it can be done. It's been done in the past. But not going to happen easily. I mean, if we can become as civilized, say, as Egyptians, then maybe we can carry it off. But 
<laughs> Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we have a federal election right now, and um, the corporate sector and its supporters are basically telling us, give us the subsidies or the jobs will go away. How should we as voters respond to that? I picked up the Globe and Mail this morning, which had a front page article about it. Kind of interesting result. As corporate taxes go down, uh, profits go up, and investment goes down. <laughs> okay, why not? <laughs> I mean, look, the period of the huge growth period, the golden age, the corporate taxes were far higher than they are now, way higher. And the uh, profits were used for investment. Uh, just like, uh, you know, banks were performing more or less the function of financial institutions. I mean, I don't happen to like state capitalism, but it was working within its own limits. Now it's just not that kind of system anymore. It's a system for enriching the wealthy. In fact, if you want, uh, the problem in, I assume Canada too, I've looked at it, but in the United States and Europe, the basic problem is lack of demand. If you want to increase demand, you give money to poor people, they spend it. When they spend money, uh, people with capital invest because they can sell something. So you want jobs and growth, give the money to the poor. You give the money to the rich, uh, why should they spend it on investment? You know, they can get a Caribbean vacation or, you know, whatever they do. You know, put the money in some tax papers. Um, the recent recession marked a flaw in neoclassical economics in the United States. Um, do you think that uh, more government regulation in the United States is possible, as for example there is in the European Union? Uh, do you think basically a welfare state in the United States is achievable? Yeah, I mean there are elements of it. Like, the, you know, the, it, it, it didn't reach the level of Europe or Canada, but it reached some level, and the same kind of pressures could make it go up. I mean, the U.S. happens to be very much a business-run society more than others, but that doesn't make it, uh, that power invulnerable. It's been overcome many times. And it takes work, you know, it doesn't happen by itself. Could you please uh, comment on any interests that are involved in uh, uh, currently Libya, but uh, before that, uh, several other nations in that part of the world uh, in their d democratic, uh, hopefully democratic, uh, uprisings? Okay. I'm sorry, I, I missed the, the question. Um, I was uh, hoping that uh, Dr. Chomsky could uh, make a statement uh, regarding the level of, uh, if there's any special interest um, from the Western world currently um, taking part in the, uh, the hopefully democratic uprisings in, uh, in Libya and other, and other countries in that area. Well, that's an interesting and long story, but the United States has a very great interest in the democratic uprisings throughout the Arab world. It's appalled by them. And there's a very obvious reason for that. Uh, and a free press would tell you in the front pages, there's a very obvious reason why the United States and Canada and England and the rest are absolutely appalled by a democratic uprising. All you have to do is look at the studies of public opinion in the Arab world. Now they're available. You can tell me about Canada. In the United States, there is zero reporting. In Britain, there's an occasional article by Jonathan Steele or somebody. But they're basically suppressed. However, planners know them. And they're released by the major institutions, like Brookings Institute and so on. And what they tell you is that, well, roughly, they say, take Egypt, the most important country. 90% uh, of the population regard the United States as the major threat to their interests. Uh, 80% think the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. 
uh, maybe 10 percent think Iran might be a threat. Uh, figures are not quite that high in the rest of the Arab world, but they're pretty similar. I mean, if you had any kind of functioning democracy, uh, public opinion would influence policy. I mean, is that what the West wants for policy in the Arab world? Uh, outlanders. Of course they have to do what they can to prevent democracy. And if you look what's happening, it's pretty standard. Uh, if there's, a, there's some pretty simple principles. If a dictator, if, a, if you have an oil-rich dictator who's pretty obedient, he gets free reign. So for example, Saudi Arabia, the most important country and the most repressive and brutal, which incidentally has been a US-British favorite forever. US and Britain have supported radical Islamism as far back as you can go uh, for good reasons. But uh, so say the dictators in Saudi Arabia can do whatever they want. Um, there was a protest called in Saudi Arabia. The police presence was so intimidating that literally nobody showed up. And same in Kuwait, there was a small protest that was crushed uh, immediately. Nobody cares. Uh, Bahrain is interesting. Uh, Bahrain is, is not important in itself, but it, it has two important aspects. One, it hosts the Fifth Fleet, the U.S. Fifth Fleet, which is the biggest military force in the region. Uh, the other is it's mostly Shiite. And uh, it's right across the causeway from eastern Saudi Arabia, which is also a majority Sikh Shiite. And that happens to be where most of the oil is. Uh, you take a look at the distribution of oil in the world, and, you know, it's concentrated right around the northern part of the Gulf, uh, which happens to be mostly Shiite. So there's been a real concern for a long time that you know, some kind of Shiite alliance might arise controlling most of the world's oil and not obedient. That's terrifying. Uh, so yes, we got to crush anything that happens in Bahrain. So that was brutally crushed. A um, Sudi-led intervention force uh, moved in, uh, was crushed, and really crushed. I mean, the, there is a kind of Tahrir Square, Pearl Square in uh, central Bahrain where the protests were, Manama in the city. And that was just dismantled. There was a big, uh, monument there, a pearl monument, that's the symbol of Bahrain. That was demolished because the uh, protesters had assembled around it. Okay, so that gets crushed. Uh, if a country uh, has oil, but the dictator isn't completely loyal, if he's erratic and uh, you know, unreliable, then it's okay to get rid of him. That's <laughs> Libya. Uh, I should say that the U.S. and Britain have very strongly supported Gaddafi. It's unbelievable how strong this is, and it goes right to the present. So just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a trial that ended in The Hague, uh, international trial of the, this tribunal on atrocities in Sierra Leone, which were horrible. And the person tried was Charles Taylor, dictator of Liberia. Uh, and it just ended about two weeks ago. However, it was incomplete. The prosecutors wanted to prosecute Gaddafi. Uh, they said that he was the one responsible for the training and the uh, financing. And uh, the chief American prosecu the prosecutor, who's an American law professor, incidentally, uh, he said that uh, Gaddafi is responsible for the death of over a million people. Well, he couldn't do it because the Britain and the United States intervened to prevent it. And when he was asked, why? He simply said, welcome to the world of oil. Okay, so not him. However, now there turns out to be a chance to get rid of him, so maybe we'll try. Uh, the French are posturing about this in ridiculous ways. I mean, if you want to know what France is up to, this wave of uprisings actually began in Western Sahara. In the last November, Western Sahara is kind of like Palestine. It's the one area that's been under foreign military occupation for decades, brutal military occupation. In that case, it happens in Morocco, it's a French ally. So there was a tent city last November, one, one of many protests that have been going on in Western Sahara. Uh, and uh, the Moroccan troops just came in and demolished it. Well, it's a UN, it's sort of a UN protectorate. It's supposed to be decolonized. So there was an effort to uh, 
uh, bring a protest to the uh, UN Security Council. That France intervened to quash it. They're not going to let anybody mess with their favorite dictators there. But, uh, you know, they're not only Levy can posture about uh, Libya and so on. Uh, but, uh, so that's just following normal procedure. Uh, what do you do in countries that don't have oil? Let's say Egypt, the most important country, or Tunisia. Well, there, there's a standard game plan. It's been followed so many times, it takes genius not to see it. I mean, over and over again, it becomes difficult to sustain a favored dictator. You know, Marcos in the Philippines, Nouvelle in Haiti, Chun uh, in South Korea, you know, Ceausescu in Romania, who was a U.S.-British favorite, uh, Mobutu in uh, you know, the Congo, you know, Suharto in Indonesia. It's always the same. Support him as long as you can. And if it becomes impossible, because maybe the army turns against him or something like that, then, you know, send him off somewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, proclaim your undying love for democracy, and then try to restore the old system, which is exactly what's happening in, in these cases. Same game plan, exactly. So it's, it's pretty predictable, and it's understandable. The West is going to do anything it can to prevent uh, authentic democracy in these regions. All you have to do is look at public opinion to see why. One last question. Another question, uh, perhaps to end on, uh, from someone who has joined us through the live streaming. Her name is Sina. With corporate culture dominating the academic system, where will that place the U.S. in terms of taking the lead in intellectual thought and practice? With corporate, corporate culture dominating the academic system. You can answer for both the U.S. and Canada, if you like, but where will that place the U.S. in terms of taking the lead in intellectual thought and practice? Well, so if, if I understood, uh, given corporate dominance, say in the U.S. and Canada, Britain, elsewhere, but where does that leave the countries in uh, defending and fostering independent thought? Okay, it's a battle, but it's not a battle that has to be lost. I mentioned cases where it's won. Of course it's going to be a battle. I mean, in universities, it's a very clear case. They are parasitic institutions, economically. They don't finance themselves. So therefore, the financing has to come from somewhere else. If it's considered a value in the society to foster independent thought and so on, okay, they get social support. And to some extent that's true, but it's declining. I gave some figures and examples. Uh, if they don't get that, they're going to have to get it from somewhere else. And that means they're going to have to get it pretty much from the corporate center, sector. That's where capital is concentrated. Okay, then comes the constant vigilance and struggle uh, to make sure that the Powell memo principles don't apply. That uh, goes on all the time. I've been wrestling with this for 50 years in my own university. Thanks very much. <laughs>